Welcome to Airway Breathing Conversation, a podcast presented by the anesthesiology residents at the University of Saskatchewan, created to provide individuals of all levels of medical knowledge with anesthesiology-related healthcare information. On this episode, we continue our conversation with Drs. Murray Deese, Chelsea Wilgenbush, David Boyle, and Nan Wu about what it means to practice family practice and anesthesiology concurrently in Saskatchewan and throughout rural Canada. Now, whether you are an anesthesiologist, resident, medical student, or member of the general public, come take a break with our host, Anesthesia PGY3 Alex Pellerin, and a multitude of brilliant and insightful guests as we demystify the incredible specialty that is anesthesiology, one episode at a time. So let's get on to this... uh really trendy topic in medicine, which is burnout, (laughs) which a lot of people have a lot of ideas about and not a lot of um, good ways to deal with it. But it's something we certainly talk a lot about. Um, Do you guys have anything that you're doing to try to prevent burnout or things that you're actively doing? Um, So I actually recently listened to, I think it was the ACRAC podcast when they were talking about um, burnout. Um, and kind of one of the things that, uh, they talked about on there was like mini kind of strategies to do small things in your life that, you know, don't take a lot of time because when I was going through medical school as a learner, it was always about, um, like having to meditate for this long, having to do yoga, like all of these things that I was like, I don't have time to shower, so I can't (laughs) take this off. Um, and so, yeah, he was talking about kind of, uh, short, simple strategies. And one of the things was, um, like inspiring awe, how anything that inspires awe in us, um, you know, brings us back to a place where we can, um, kind of cultivate joy and appreciate things and have gratitude. And so, um, you know, going for a walk, which sounds absolutely crazy, but just going outside, seeing nature, seeing trees and trying to kind of generate that feeling of like the world is pretty awesome and, you know, life is pretty awesome. Um, I do think that's an easy thing to do uh, sometimes when you have a little one in your house because they're just inspired by absolutely everything they do and are just pure joy. So um, interacting with my nine month old has been really good for that. Um, but yeah, I would encourage anyone to listen to that kind of episode and, um, I can't remember the guy's name, but, uh, look up some of his like short strategies for, um, preventing burnout, because I think that there are things that are bite-sized that we can do in our day-to-day life to kind of ground ourselves and keep ourselves well. So that's something I've been doing and coloring. You guys, coloring is lit. <laughs> oh, I, I love coloring. <laughs> Adult coloring books are where it's at. 100%. Yeah, coloring book. Man, I, yeah. Yeah, any sort of like zone out activity, hey, where you just don't really have to use all that mental power that you've been doing all day at work. And like being an anesthesiologist, as you guys know very well, is all about being like hyper vigilant. And that requires so much mental and emotional energy that people have no idea about. They just think that we're sitting in the OR, writing down vitals. No, 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 no. It's so much more than that. So, yeah. Awesome. Those are great. Thanks, Chelsea. Yeah, that sounds like a great podcast that I'm going to have to listen to. Because uh, this is, like Alex said, something I think of a lot about, but I'm not sure how good I'm actually following some of these strategies of preventing some burnout. Um, one of the probably biggest one for me was that uh, a lot of thought of an intentionally coming to Melfort, so picking a community where I would have support both personally and professionally. So I think now it sounds like we've, we, we definitely, I know have a lot more positions there now than when Murray was in Melfort. So there's more of us to help to share the load. And they, there's a good group of people that I actually went to med, med school with. We went through med school together, did residency together. So there's a good core of friends personally there my wife and my 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 family my wife's family are both there so we have a lot of family support and we have three uh 
family practice anesthesiologist in Melfort, which seems like a pretty wild um, ratio considering some other communities much larger have less anesthesia providers. So going to a place where you have support both personally and professionally uh, has kind of been my thing that is, is helping me the, the most, I think. And I'm trying to work on, you know, setting boundaries and not saying yes to everything. Uh, me but that's too, work, David. Work me in too. Progress. <laughs> <laughs> that's the hard thing to do is to say no. It is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, Nan, do you have anything that you're doing? Um, no, I got the baby. I cannot say no to the, to the baby. <laughs> well, the, the strategy depends on whether before I have the baby or after I have the baby. Um, yes. Yeah, so, uh, like it, it's, uh, quite isolated as I've been in the North and then uh, a lot of people, when they, when they come to work in Galloway, they, they say, oh, they have a six weeks on, they work really, really hard in Galloway, and then they have a six weeks off, and then they enjoy uh, back home. But uh, since I'm here, like, all the time, so uh, it, this is not the sustainable lifestyle. Like, I, I need to find a way to enjoy, like, uh, as part of the community here. So before I have the baby, uh, we do have a lot of uh, a group of friends, and then uh, we play a lot of badminton here. Even it's a very cold outside, there's a lot of activities that are happening in Kaluach here. So um, I do find that uh, it's a great uh, social event when we're playing a lot of sports up here. Um, so since I got the baby, uh, we haven't been going for any of the sports events yet, but we do have a lot of visitors coming to see our baby. They just drop by and saying hi. And uh, that gave us a lot of uh, relief from work. And uh, after a long day of work, after I get home, I see the baby. Uh, it's uh, it's a good relief. I feel like it's, it helps you to forget everything from the work, and you can just focus on the family. It does get tired when you don't get any sleep at night, and then the next day you still have a whole day of slate of OR to do. Uh, so we take some break, vacation from time to time. And uh, so let our family to help out uh, taking care of a baby. We're actually taking a three weeks off uh, in the next couple of days. We're going down to Toronto to see our family. So nice. that'll be a baby's uh, first trip. Yeah, I'm really excited about it and uh, about taking a break and uh, letting our parents to see the baby. Yeah, and maybe like letting your parents lighten the load a little bit for you. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, my parents haven't seen the baby <laughs> since he was born yet. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I remember those days, uh, 4.30 or 5 in the morning, rocking my daughter and the baby Bjorn. Oh, baby Bjorn. And then going in to work for a busy office and then a night of call and then a f following day yeah. of a busy office. Um, that taught yeah. me that you should never do anything in life to make yourself special. You should make sure that there's dozens of people that can replace you and do exactly what you do. Oh my gosh, 100%. Yeah, yeah. and unfortunately yeah. for these folks, they're extremely special. So thank you for being so special. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I was wondering if you guys could take us through what your normal day looks like. Yeah. I. Since I've kind of shifted my practice, um, I probably have a more kind of boring day um, in terms of kind of the services I'm providing. Uh, so typically I uh, wake up or my child wakes me up and uh, I go to the operating room. And if it's an on-call day, um, then I have a slate, uh, usually from eight to four, and then I would kind of manage any call cases. Um, we are kind of a smaller site. We have, uh, positions for five full-time anesthesia providers. Right now we have two, sometimes three. Um, so we're providing call for the emergency room for any sort of intubations. We do most of the lines in the hospital, uh, arterial lines in the ICU, um, as well as central lines on for the entire hospital. Uh, we're on call for obstetrics 24 seven when we're on call. So all epidurals, all C-sections. Um, and then we're also on call for the main OR. So, um, you know, if there's any ortho cases or general surgery cases that need added to the day after hours, we do those. And 
Yeah. Some days, you know, you are kind of running between your OR cases to put an epidural in. Uh, Sometimes you're, you know, abandoning your slate to go up and do a cesarean section and then coming back down and finishing your elective stuff. Um, Of course, when you're not on call, your day is a little bit usually smoother, but because we are a small site, we really help each other out. And, you know, uh, if you can help the call guy by, doing lines or anything else you often do. So you work as a team here to kind of get the work done every day. Um, Every day is a little bit different, but generally just going to the OR and uh, waiting for the phone to ring. Gotcha. And how often are you on call now? Um, I would say every third or fourth day. Every third or fourth day. Gotcha. Kind of one in three to one in four, depending. Like next week, I think I'm on call Tuesday and then Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Gotcha. And do you normally, um, if you're on call during the week, do you work post-call usually? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We try to um, give a shorter designation. So we usually would say that the post-call person will be in something like endoscopy that's a little bit less kind of um, cognitive load. And we usually try to start them at 10 a.m., or we'll put them in the pre-anesthetic clinic from kind of 10 to three. Usually just a later start to accommodate for if you have a late night. That's awesome. Yeah. So at least you can get like a, li- a little bit, catch a little bit of sleep if you had a really busy night. That's yeah. great. How about you, David? Um, our our schedule is a bit of a jugg- juggling act. Um, so I, for anesthesia, there's three of us. We so we do call one and three. Usually we do anywhere from two to four days in a row of anesthesia call. And our anesthesia call here is, is typically a little bit lighter. So we have one OR that runs. And so like one day we might do scopes, another day will be full day of general surgery. Um, we have visiting surgeons that do they'll do ENT or some plastics or some cataracts, or we have orthopedics. And then we also have urology. So they'll come for their scheduled days. But then we, we have one in-house surgeon, and we have <clears throat> three people who can provide C-section coverage, or C-section, basically. So our overnight or late-night stuff is really only, is mostly C-sections and the occasional sick general surgery patient. So usually we're not operating in the middle of the night uh, very frequently. Um, usually the nighttime stuff is, is epidurals that, that might wake you up. So it's a little bit um, less onerous that way, but there are there has been days where those four days can get, get pretty long from time to time. So my typical day is I'll get up, I'll go in and I'll round on my inpatient. And then if it's a clinic day, I'll go to clinic uh, the clinic here in Melford's kind of nice. It's attached to the hospital. It's a it's a separate building, but it's attached by a walkway. Um, so usually the the clinic is running, and if I'm on anesthesia call, then I may have to run back to do an epidural or do a C-section, and I can just go back and forth. And fortunately, all of my patients were previously Dr. Logan Bush's patients, so they're used to that. They're used to understanding that their physician may have to abandon them briefly to, or for not so brief periods of time uh, to go and handle other things. Um, and then I also, we do an emergency room as well. Our emergency rooms are, our emergency call is 24 hours. Uh, here, I find that really difficult, especially with balancing anesthesia, because I find it very hard to do a 24 hour merge and then try and run a slate the next day or something like that. So I, there's a few of us that split our merge shifts. So we'll split them into 12 hour shifts. So uh, we'll do 8 a.m. till, usually we do 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. and then 6 p.m. to 8 a.m. Because overnight is usually not quite as busy. And I find that that helps me to still be able to keep some reasonable sleep schedule and help me to kind of function as a, as a human and a physician. Um, so yeah, my day starts with seeing my inpatients and then I either go to the ER, the OR or the clinic or Humboldt 
I go to Humboldt and provide anesthesia there a few days a month. And uh, my receptionist is works hard. She has access to my uh, professional acural schedule, like in my EMR, and also my personal uh, eye calendar schedule, and very regularly has to remind me of, of conflicts. So that's it's it's a lot of fun, but it is a lot of work to try to to try to schedule with doing so many different things. Yeah, absolutely. It's important to have um, really good people behind you, helping you, keeping you organized. How about you, Nan? Yeah. Um, in Kaluit here, uh, we have two operating rooms, and then we typically start at 7.30, and we aim to finish at 2.30. So in the afternoon, we can go to the PAC clinic um, and to see the next day's patient if they are complicated. Um, usually, the uh, operating room, uh, one operating room is split between gen search and uh, gynecology. So they will do a lot of gen search cases and uh, uh, possibly C elective C-sections and uh, tubal ligations and TBT tapes. Um, the other room is uh, uh, half of the time is a piece dental and uh, the other half could be scopes. Uh, they could be a visiting specialist like ENT also and uh, like whoever coming to a college visiting us and then they will have the OR slate. Um, so... Uh, we, we do have a three uh, GP anesthesia full time over here, and then we occasionally have locums coming as well. So usually the, 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 they're one person on call and uh, at any time. And usually we have like usually one in three on call, uh, but we, we, our call is not too heavy. So we don't typically anticipate a lot of calls over the night. Uh, usually rarely we do have uh, emergency uh, surgeries that we need to call in uh, after midnight. So. During the call, we also cover for ER if, especially if they have an unstable patient. Uh, we do not have a, a internist or ICU doctor here. So, like whenever they have an emergency there that need an intubation, that needs the stabilization, hemodynamic support, putting in special lines, and then we kind of put on our ICU doctor hat, and then uh, we just go into the room. Sometimes we give them a little bit of support to give them advice, but sometimes if the patient is really uh, uh, unwell and then needs the ongoing resuscitation, we kind of take over those patients uh, for ER and the inpatient. Um, our OB uh, here in Inuit populations, they do have a cultural uh, preference for natural delivery, so we don't get caught a lot for epidurals. Most of the uh, the, the lo local people, they, they, they gave birth naturally, like a uh, 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 they, they gave birth at a very young age, and then there's a very strong cultural preference to uh, having birth naturally without epidural. So we don't get caught for epidural very often. Uh, and the C-section rate is pretty low here. Uh, most of the women, they gave birth without the issues there. So um, uh, so that is a, a, a benefit. Yeah, so we don't get a caught in for stat C-section very often. Yeah. Um, Apart from that, uh, occasionally we I still pick up an emergency uh, shift. Uh, our emergency shift is like uh, nine hours uh, during the daytime and then 12 hours at nighttime. But since I started uh, GP anesthesia, they haven't been giving me a lot of night shift. So that is good too. <laughs> so we can work the next day, uh, continue our OR slate. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's really important to recognize all the responsibilities these guys have. Mm -hmm. they, you know, they, they run uh, a full spectrum family practice clinic uh, as well as emergency work. Um, they're small business people. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Um, and they provide enormous uh, services, not just for emergencies, but like, for example, in, in Saskatchewan, uh, family practice and needs just provide a, a huge portion of the pediatric dental anesthetics that are done. Um you know, offloading a lot of that uh, from the major centers and also allowing patients to have surgeries closer to home. Yeah. Um, I think it's fair to say that the FPA program is competitive. It's that? extremely competitive. It's extremely competitive. We have like 20 or 25 applications for what used to be two spots. Now we have four spots. Mm -hmm. It's extremely competitive. It, it often... Um, um, breaks our hearts when we have to make our lists. 
Right. Because you want to, you would love to train, Mm -hmm. you know, a ton of people, obviously, but there's only capacity um, for so much at our center and probably the same when they go to PA and, and go to Regina or what have you. Um, If you were to, um, like, I guess what I'm wondering is, because it is so competitive, what are some of the traits that you're sort of looking for when you are reviewing people's applications? That's a fantastic question. Uh, it, it's really difficult. Um, you know, we, we do look for um, characteristics that will make them more likely to stay in Saskatchewan. Right. Um, but, you know, they have to be, we really have to make sure that, um, or do our best to ensure that these the candidates are people that we think will be able sus- to sustain this intense one-year program. Mm-hmm. That's very difficult when you all you have to base it on is a is a, a you know the, looking at their references and then a short interview. Mm-hmm. So it's really nice when um, the the um, future FBA uh, candidates do a rotation with us. Absolutely which is also not easy because we're so saturated with learners. I have a number of, of uh, residents that are trying to get electives with us, but we just don't have space for them. So it's mm-hmm. not ideal and it's difficult. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, as, as all of you probably know, there's a, a fairly significant shortage of anesthesia providers across uh, the country. So we have increased capacity here and, and in other centers as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, would um, anyone on Zoom also say that like there's traits that you've noticed? There's traits that I've certainly noticed going through the program for three years um, through the FPAs. And one of the things that I've noticed is how incredibly hardworking um, all the residents are. Yeah, they're they're you know they need to be independent, um, self directed, and motivated people to do the FPA job. Mm-hmm. So we want those same qualities in the residents. And um, we've always tried to structure the program with lots of latitude um, to let, you know, most of these, you know, like most of them are adult learners. Um, it's, yeah, so we try to give them flexibility and let right. them do what they need to do. Yeah, focus on the areas that are most important. Yeah. Um, like you mentioned, Chelsea, like carrying the trauma and code pager um, more often or doing things if you think that you're going to have more um, experience to more trauma where you're practicing, then be involved more in those cases. Seek those learning opportunities out um, to make sure that you feel the most comfortable when you're done. Absolutely. Yeah, because you don't feel comfortable when you're done. I'll never no. forget my first yeah. case. Uh, it's, you know, it's just completely surreal. I was driving to the hospital and thinking, what the hell am I doing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like coming in, driving from home to, to a trauma. No, no. Like my first elective list I did in Melfort. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. Like starting in a situation. I've made a horrible just, mistake. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's really daunting. It's very daunting. Yeah. Especially when you've um, done so much of medicine, having a preceptor right behind you. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then all of a sudden you're on your own. Yeah. A lot of nights spent staring at the ceiling. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Um, what do you guys think on Zoom? I do want to say, I think it's important to acknowledge that that point. That like By the end of the FBA year, you'll feel pretty comfortable and you'll be like, yeah, I got this. I could do this. And then you get to that first case and it doesn't matter what it is, but you, it, it's scary. And Chelsea, Chelsea warned me about it. Tanner Schatz warned me about it. And I was like, I don't know, guys. Like, I, it feels pretty good. And then <laughs> yeah, you get that first award day and there's no preceptor looking over your shoulder. There's no a- other anesthesia provider in the town. And you're like, man, if things don't go well, I'm the only one here. Yeah. And it's, uh, we talk about, talk about feeling humbled, but like, yeah, it, it makes you, makes you feel humble pretty, pretty quick and really respect the, um, amount of responsibility that you have as, as the anesthesia provider in that setting. And, but then you just kind of fall back on the training and the reps that you did through the year here. And the first day goes well and the next day goes well, and there'll always be a little blip. But if you just, like everyone said, if you, if you've worked hard and gone through the program, you'll definitely have the skills and the knowledge base 
to manage what you need to manage competently. And then the confidence slowly starts to build. I'm still waiting to feel comfortable. I'm assuming <laughs> it'll maybe happen one day. Never, <laughs> never. Yeah, you're taking a completely healthy person, putting them in, putting them in grave danger. Yes. And then you have to get them out of it. It's uh, it's not something to be taken lightly. No, absolutely not. Yeah. Especially when you've done as as a um, local anesthesia legend who was passed on, Peter McDougall used to say, especially when you're in the accelerated program, the FBA program, only one year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, like it's been almost one year since I started practice. I, I feel like one of the, the uh, because FPA usually works in the setting that they have a limited support. Um, I think one thing is that we have to be very prudent and be careful about what kind of cases we select to do here. Um, because I think you never know you made a good decision when you deferring the cases to the specialist, but you always know when you made a bad decision that you <laughs> induce the, the patient and then the things goes wrong. So um, so I think it, it's good that you, you need to recognize the, what kind of support you have. Uh, here in Calouette, we uh, I do have a very good uh, support with the two much a very experienced uh, GP anesthesia doctors with me. So if there's any issues, and I always counsel them to see, hey, like oh, what do you think of doing the case here versus sending them down south to do it. So I think that's a trait that that the the GPA needs to have in order to have a safe, uh, sustainable practice here. Um, especially for elective cases. That's the hardest part uh, when you say that, yes, one, take on this case, and then you also take on the risk of doing the case as well. Yeah, I think you bring up a really good point, Nan, that I don't even think I really appreciated because obviously um, us being in a large center here with ICU capabilities and all the specialists here, we don't think twice um, obviously, we try to see patients and optimize them as best we can, but we um, are just like, yeah, well, you know, what happens will happen. Mm-hmm. We've talked to patients about the risks of of having this surgery or having this anesthetic, and we have a lot of backup. And yeah. I think um, you guys all were nodding like very, very well uh, when Nan started talking about like case selection. Um, do you guys find uh, that that's a really big thing that you are thinking about all the time? when you're doing anesthetics in remote areas? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. I sometimes feel like my brain is just a bunch of tidbits of awesome kind of tips I got while I was in residency that I just say as one-offs. But I think it might have even been Murray who talked to me about um, like the importance of recognizing what your institution can do relative to what you can do. Mm. Um, and how important case selection is because yeah, like Nan said, people are going to, you know, you're going to pay the price if you've made a poor decision in patient selection. And so just because I feel comfortable doing something doesn't mean I should do it in Melfort. Like just because I have the skills to do it doesn't mean that my institution has the skills. My nurses have the skills, um, that we can support the potential bad outcomes that could come. Um, you know, I never want to get into a situation where I'm uh, transferring a patient intubated post-op to Saskatoon because I thought I could do it and Been there. You know, we can't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, so I do think going back to kind of traits of FPAs, I think you need to be kind of a um, person who obviously is a good critical thinker, a person who is um, and a good independent learner, but I also think you have to be kind of a strong personality as well, mm. because there are going to be times where people are going to push you to do things that you know you shouldn't do. Um, and I, I mean, I get that sometimes here too. And uh, one of the awesome co-residents that I was in the program with, uh, Allison Finningley, uh, kind of said to me this summer, she was like, you know, that's an important part of your job, but that's the, one of the best parts of your jobs is, is you can have a limit and you can say, this is beyond my limit. This is not appropriate. This isn't appropriate for me or this facility. We need to transfer this patient. And she said, some days I wish that I could say, I don't want to do this case. <laughs> and so, you know, you yeah. need to be really aware of your own limitations and have good insight and be okay with saying, this isn't for me. Uh, this isn't what's best for this patient. And we need to transfer them to a higher level of care. 
It has nothing to do with you as a doctor or your ability as a GP anesthetist, but that's what's appropriate for that patient. And sometimes having those conversations is really hard. I've had patients actually get pissed off at me when I've said that they have to be transferred to Regina. Mm. Um, I've had them say mean things to me, you know, like, well, you're not good enough at your job. And, you know, you take that and you just say, at the end of the day, I think this is what's best for you. And I'm concerned about your safety and I just want to keep you well. But yeah, it's a really hard job sometimes when you do have to do that. But I think learning that in residency and uh, being comfortable in that is really, really important. And Yeah, so much of anesthesia is about leadership, communication, advocacy. Like those are really, I think, some core traits to being an anesthesiologist. And I, I feel like when you're in a rural and remote setting, that is like even more heightened. Um, like, just like you're saying, like, even though that patient really doesn't quite understand why you're not going to do that case, you're actually advocating for that patient to have the best care that they can have. Um, and like being that kind of gatekeeper and ensuring that that takes place is super vital. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's all that can med stuff. Um, yeah, 100%. Resources and stuff. Um, I used to, in those situations, I used to tell the patient, I, I have two jobs. Uh, to keep you safe and keep you happy. And, you know, most days I can do both, but today I can only do one of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've, I've heard you say that many times. I have stolen that line. I use it all the time now. I think just like you were saying, Chelsea, like you. That's another <laughs> you well, I got it from somebody else yeah, too. So yeah, yeah. You just like, on. yeah, you just take these small bits of people's practice and like meld it into your owner. Yeah, these these sayings that people say that you'll you'll never forget for sure ring true all the time and rant that was my uh, <laughs> I think uh, I think it was Murray who talked to me about that um it's uh, it's one of the most important things that the FP has to learn in that short mm -hmm. year is patient selection and um you know uh, developing strategies to um stand your round and um you know keep keep you your patient in your facility safe um because uh, I mean, unfortunately, you know, we live in kind of an ivory tower world and when complications happen here, well, there are complications, but sometimes for the poor FPAs, if a complication happens, it's, you know, look on more as a, a screw up in Saskatoon or Regina, which is not fair at all, mm -hmm. um, you know, until you've walked a mile in their shoes. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. It's never... Um like um, things that happen within medicine or bad outcomes are never one person's fault. It's so many colliding factors that uh, that lead to that. That's very, very important to remember. Um, David or Nan, did you have any um, thoughts about uh, traits that uh, an FPA should have? I think it's kind of hard to pick what would make a good FPA. We kind of, you think that everybody who gets into med school has already been selected to have all the traits to be a good physician. Like ideally they're already hardworking, they're independent, they're a good communicator, which is usually the case, but not, we, we can maybe all think of some exceptions to that from time to time. Um, but yeah, I think to have some characteristics that make a good FPA. I think you have to be, you definitely have to be flexible because especially if you're working in a place where you're wearing multiple hats and you're doing a family clinic and then you're getting called to go and do a, some, do a surgical case and then you're coming back, um, jumping back into your clinic. So you have to be someone that is able to, you know, not fly by the seat of your pants, but be comfortable with, with changes, changes throughout the day is big. And I think you have to be, you have to be confident, but you also have to be humble. Being an anesthesiologist, you're, you're in, you're in charge of a lot for that person. Like that line that Murray said earlier about taking a, perfectly healthy person putting them in grave danger uh it echoes in my head every day before i go and do a an or slate I, I i think about that and so it's super 
super critical to, to, to be humble. And sometimes it is what the facility can do. Um, but sometimes it is what you can do as an FPA. Like if it's a case that you haven't done since your training, cause it's been 10 years and you think you can do it, maybe, maybe you shouldn't. And to be humble enough to say, you know what, like, no, I haven't done something like this in a long time. Uh, even though maybe your facility could manage it, it's just something that I, I maybe don't feel comfortable with and, and being okay with that. Like at the end of the day, yeah, if something was bad, we're responsible as an anesthesiologist, but it's the patient that really pays the price. Uh, so as long as you're always thinking about what's best for the patient and someone else said, if you, if you wouldn't feel comfortable um, performing the procedure on your own grandmother, you should probably let someone else do it. Uh, so that's a little tidbit that I like to think about. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Now, did you have anything you wanted to add about the good traits of being um, an okay? I think, uh, yeah, they have to be calm during crisis and then they mm-hmm. have to uh, be able to think critically uh, in the crisis, remain calm. And uh, yeah, and then they also have to recognize their limit, I think. Being prudent in their practice, being calm. And uh, again, as Chelsea said, it has to be strong in, because we do get a lot of push for doing the cases locally because maybe for various reasons, maybe they're shorter wait list or, uh, or the patient preference, but we have to be strong and having holding our line, being able to say no, and I explain them to the patient. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We've talked a lot about um, like the unique challenges of being an FPA, um, but I don't want to keep you guys here forever. So I, I was hoping that you could um, tell us what you think the best part about being an FPA is or the most rewarding part about being an FPA. Um, so I'm the furthest out from the program. So I've kind of had, I feel like I've lived multiple lives already in my FPA practice. Um, and I'm sure David can attest to this, but I will say like those first four years where I did um, general family practice with, I did a lot of low risk obstetrics um, as well as family practice anesthesia. Um, it was like, I don't know if there's another job where you can see a patient at their prenatal appointment in the morning. They go into labor later that night. You go in, assess them for labor you go in and do their epidural and then something goes wrong and you end up as their anesthesiologist in their case. Like when I was doing C-sections for my own patients, um, yeah, like it, I think that they were so calm. Like I remember one of my patients, when I put her spinal in, she goes, wow, you're really good at this. (laughs) Like it's a whole skill set that she didn't even know I possessed. Mm -hmm. And just having that patient relationship Um, like I know her, I know her mom, her mom's my patient. Uh, I know where their cabin is. Um, I delivered both their kids. And so like, it's a really unique job, the way that you get to be people's family doctors, like Mary or like Murray said from kind of cradle to grave. And then you get to be with these people in these really intense situations that, um, otherwise you wouldn't get to. And so, it's a really unique niche job. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really, really rewarding in that uh, regard. Yeah, that's really, really well said. Um, <laughs> my poppy is just coming to say hi as well. Kind of. Are you coming to say hi or no? Okay, she's not going to crash the <laughs> interview. Sorry about that. No, that's uh, totally fine. Yeah, my two-year-old just woke up from her now. So, yeah, like, I think one of the best things about this job is something that also just makes rural family medicine um, super enjoyable, like Chelsea said, is that you get to know your patients on such a, a personal level and you know their whole families. And at the same time, too, as a rural family, as a rural family doctor, we really strongly work together as a team. So right now in Melbourne, we have 13 doctors and I think everyone has their niche. Like we have a couple people that are really into obstetrics and like they help out a lot with that. We have a couple of people that are like interested in dermatology, a few people that are more kind of internal medicine-y minded, some people that do a little bit more surgical stuff. And 
I feel like family practice anesthesia is, I feel very lucky to be able to offer that support to my colleagues. And like, I always, I always loved emergency medicine, but I always kind of felt uncomfortable in some of those acute settings. And with my training, being able to have that confidence to come in and have, um, and to be able to help my colleagues when I know that they're in a situation that they've maybe never dealt with before or deal with every few years and, um, and to be able to support them in that way and know that it's making a positive in, uh, impact on the patient care is super rewarding. I, I thought it was really, I had a really, really uh, amazing experience the other day, actually. There's a old South African physician who's been here all forever he probably worked with Marie when he was here and like well, I can remember him being here from as far back as I like since I was little here and he just was a doctor that everyone knew um, everyone likes and he could do everything Pierre and what's that Pierre yeah it was, yeah. Yeah, it was it he was, delivered uh, both of my Pierre kids <laughs> yeah. yeah so he's just a phenomenal physician uh very hugely respected like he always he took care of my family and everyone that we know at some point and but he was he had a very sick patient one day in the emergency department and he was he was he needed help at the end of the day he just he just needed help securing the patient's airway and resuscitating the patient and I happened to be up in the OR and we had just finished our case so I rushed down and was able to work with this doctor who I like really looked up to and thought of like oh this is what a this is what a rural physician is and never thought that I'd ever be able to do something like what he does. And then here I am helping him, providing him uh, some support. And we were able to intubate the patient and resuscitate her. And she ultimately was transferred to Saskatoon and had a full recovery. Uh, but that was exactly, that was one of the, besides the stuff of being able to provide anesthesia cover, coverage in a rural community and provide the patient care, to be able to to be able to support my colleagues like that was exactly why I went into the program. Mm. It was just a it was a really rewarding experience for me. That is awesome. That is such a good story. Um, so for me, I think um, being anesthesia is that uh, like a patient goes through surgeries that uh, uh, most of the time will help out the patient's life, actually. So I, I do find that part is really rewarding. Everyone comes to the surgery feeling very anxious. And uh, uh, at the end of the surgery, when patient, uh, when patient wake up and then they say, oh, you did a great job, I feel comfortable and I'm safe. So just like Dr. D said, uh, we did both of our job well. I think that's really rewarding at the end of the day. Patients do get really uh, uh, appreciated about uh, what the surgery changed their life. Um, yeah, and also David also mentioned about uh, we have an extra set of a skill and then uh, we can help out our colleagues. And uh, both the patients and our colleagues are very thankful for our, our extra skills and our help too. So I find those ones are very, very rewarding. Awesome. Um, thank you all so much for coming, Dr. D, Dr. Bush, Dr. Boyle, Dr. Wu. Um, we appreciate your time so much. We know how busy you are um, and you guys all have little ones running around as well. So that makes you even more busy than the average person. Um, so we just thank you so much for taking the time to come on the podcast and talk about your experiences and share so freely. Such, such amazing, such great stories uh, to hear from you guys. And um, yeah, I can't wait for this episode to come out. I think people are going to think it's awesome. Could I say just... No, oh, absolutely, Dr. Okay. Deese, yeah. So so this this program falls under the enhanced skills uh, uh, umbrella of the family medicine department. And we have wonderful people there that help and support us. Uh, um, um, Sheila Smith, Marty Haru, and uh, the the impeccable uh, Jalene Jepson. And then in our department, Megan uh, Fortoski is a big help, as well as Eugene Chu. And uh, every single member of our department is so welcoming to the FPAs, takes pride in training them. Um, uh, you know, without them, we'd never be able to put out wonderful finished products like Chelsea, David, and Nan. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Awesome. Well, thank you so much again um, for joining us today. Um, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Hopefully it's nice and sunny where you are. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for having us. And like I said, when you extend the invitation, I'm always happy to talk about how amazing the FDA program is at uh, U of S. So, yeah, thanks for the opportunity. And yeah, thanks to uh, Marie for selecting us and uh, letting us come and uh, be thorns in your side for a year. Um, yeah, it was a privilege to train in the program and it is a privilege to provide um, FPA services to the province. So thanks. Thank you. Yeah. I'm very grateful for for being able to uh, to uh, went through the program too. Yeah, and I'm very thankful about it. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. You've been listening to Airway Breathing Conversation, a podcast hosted and presented by the anesthesiology residents at the University of Saskatchewan. Please note that while this podcast is run by healthcare professionals, it is intended for educational and entertainment purposes only. We are very thankful to our guests for taking the time to share their wisdom with us this episode, and a very special thanks to you, our listeners, for tuning in. Don't forget to follow us and our associated USASC Anesthesia accounts on social media. You can find all our social media links on our Linktree page at linktr.ee slash abc underscore podcast. You can also find the department's social media links on their Linktree page at linktr.ee slash usask underscore anesthesia. We'll see you next episode, but until then, stay calm, take a breath, and always remember your ABCs.